with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. Ah. If I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. I'm not on camera. I can pick my teeth. We are broadcasting <laughs> live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA, on the program today. Emma picks her teeth. <laughs> but first, Blake Emerson, assistant professor at the UCLA School of Law, on the Fifth Circuit ruling, which constitutes an assault on the very functioning of government. Then, assistant professor at Michigan Law School, Leah Littman, on the latest uh, ruling by the Supreme Court that allows for more bribery of our politicians and the assault on a person's right for a legitimate criminal defense. Meanwhile, it's primary day. In Georgia, it's hot Republican-on-Republican action. Texas has a runoff where we could see a big progressive win, and then stuff will happen in Arkansas and Alabama. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania, still an open wound for the Republicans. McCormick takes a scalpel to Dr. <laughs> Oz's thousand vote lead. Alexandra Biagi uh, to take on Bigfoot Sean Patrick Maloney. And it's official, Schrader loses in Oregon. One of the nine who insisted upon the splitting of the Build Back Better and infrastructure deal doesn't appear to have helped him. Joe Biden says our Taiwan policy is unchanged. 6-3 vote at the Supreme Court says too bad to death row inmates with crappy representation. U.S. starts to ease sanctions in Venezuela for oil, of course. Speaking of which, White House is desperate for a way to ease gas prices. No coincidence. Three months in, a Russian U.N. diplomat resigns over the invasion of Ukraine. And the AP, now the latest to concede... It was probably the Israeli military who killed that Palestinian-American reporter. And lastly, Kushner and Mnuchin. Remember those two? Sitting in a tree. Sitting in a tree and apparently counting their money from all of the corrupt deals they set up while they were in the White House with uh, Middle East oligarchs. All this and more on today's Majority Report. I'm not sure oligarchs is the right word. Maybe monarchs. I like the concept of ol or using oligarchs and not just in reference to Russian rich people. Or or American rich people. Yeah. Um, Emma Viglin is here, as you can see. Hello. Give us a smile. There we go. I All don't right. know, though. <laughs> I don't know. I wasn't because uh, you shamed me. I don't know if I was able to do a thorough enough look. I once had like a piece of I lettuce. I did not shame you. Yeah, well. Uh, tomato, tomato. Uh, I once no, had a... not tomato, tomato. I did. I just looked over and I saw you like uh, doing something weird with your teeth, and then I didn't say anything about it. Okay. Well, you know. You did. Maybe I'm just projecting. Yeah, um, that is, I think, exactly what it. you do. I once had uh, lettuce in my teeth, like on a live show, uh, maybe three years ago, and I've never lived it down. Do so... I have something in my teeth? Exactly. <laughs> So I check it, I think, like, you know, specifically if I eat before the show, I check it a good amount. 
Newsday Tuesday. Newsday Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen. Um, primaries, like we said, in Georgia. The uh, And we will talk more about this uh, later in the program. But this, um, we're starting to see the contours of the interesting fight that will happen in the run-up to the 2024 election uh, in uh, Georgia. But let us leave that interesting fight between Republicans and to the more immediate one, which is the race for the governorship in Georgia, which will take place in five months, six months, whatever whatever November to May is. And... Um, they are, uh, Purdue is, it appears, at least in terms of the polling, is, is doing quite poorly. And what do you do when you're a Republican and you live in the South or, well, let's be honest, in America at this point, what do you do to increase your appeal to Republican voters? Well, in the case of Georgia, it's extremely convenient because in most places, not well, not most places, in some places, if you're a Republican and you're trying to increase your favorability rating, like let's say you're Donald Trump and you're not running against anybody, you're already president, you've got to look around for a black person to uh, vilify. Well, David Perdue, fortunately for him in his attempt to uh, run for the gubernatorial nomination for Republicans, need only look at who will be the Democratic nominee, and that, of course, is Stacey Abrams. And here is David Perdue here running for the Republican nomination by showing that he is willing to go all in on the racism. Did y'all see what Stacey said this weekend? Said that Georgia is the worst place in the country to live. Hey, she ain't from here. Let her go back where she came from. She doesn't like it here. The only thing she wants is to be president of the United States. She doesn't care about the people of Georgia. That's clear. You know, when we saw in 18 what she did and what she said, oh, we're going to have a blue wave, we're going to do it with documented and undocumented workers. You know, I don't think a lot of people in Georgia understood that when she told black farmers, you don't need to be on the farm, and you, she told black workers in hospitality and all this, you don't need to be – she is demeaning her own race when it comes to that. I am really over this. She should never be considered for material for a governor. Now, let me just, uh, as, as, uh, uh, as, as Purdue's uh, campaign manager, let me just explain. Uh, uh, Stacey Abrams, as you can see here, uh, we'll put it on. Uh, she is originally from Wisconsin. And that's, that's what Purdue was saying. There. Yankee. Yeah, she, she, she is a Yankee. Go back. Go back to Wisconsin, where you spent the first, I don't know, uh, 18 months of your life. She, she claims she still remembers uh, cheese curds. Mm. So she should go back there. And I feel bad for other black people because she is a discredit to her race from all in Wisconsin. And then as she leave Wisconsin, she went all the way down to Mississippi. They don't understand Southern values. In Mississippi, they don't understand that. That's why I say go back to Wisconsin and your cheese, your cheese head. It wasn't it wasn't about anything else than that. I I didn't even know she um she was uh, black She's until what? until black? Uh, until, <laughs> until later in the sentence where I said she was discredited to a race. Uh, we should just put out the uh, full context of what Abrams said. <clears throat> Uh, now, here's what Abram said. Now, somebody's going to try to politifact me on this. Let me contextualize. When you're number 48 for mental health, when you're number one for maternal mortality, when you have an incarceration rate that's on the rise and wages that are on the decline, then you're number one. Then you're not the number one place to live in the United States. Oh, yeah. Go back to where you uh, live from, where uh, everything's number one. That's the thing. Too much pressure. Too much pressure on people. And that is... That Why do is, you sound like JFK? So, so. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm like somewhere... I don't know. You I, like I, politicians that run about keeping everything as good as it is and acting like it's as good as it could be. Yeah, we want more change, but also uh, less change. Just more delusion. More delusion. Look, let me just remind everybody, she's black. and uh, <laughs> But I also like... 
uh, other black people except for the ones that are going to run for office. And so she's discredit to a race. And, of course, also uh, illegal immigrant and also not from Georgia. And she's like, uh, uh, let me just mix all that in, mash it up, mash it up like a like a. Like a, uh, Governor Leghorn, like ladies a, and gentlemen. Like a, like a booyah base. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, no, like a jambalaya. A jambalaya, yeah. Well, that one, you're Gumbo. from, because it sounds like you're from New Orleans. Maybe you you should go back to where you came from. I Me, mean, personally, I'm, a, I'm very confused. I'm, I'm pan-southern. Both, I, I'm from uh, southern Massachusetts. And so that is, uh, I was down near um, uh, the, uh, Bedford. Bedford, Mass, and uh, we have a slightly different accent there. So did he pull this out, like, literally the night before the primary? Oh, yeah. That was was it? This was literally last night. Wow. At his tele-rally. I mean, honestly, like, what does it tell you about the Republican Party? When the guy is losing, at least in the polling, to Kemp in his primary, that he's got to remind everybody, I'm on your side because I'm going to remind you he's going to be running against a black guy. A black woman. So <laughs> there you go. And like also just it's really disappointing and maybe not surprising the level that our media can get the uh, uh, issue like this too when it just becomes Stacey Abrams says it's the worst state to live in and not David Perdue defends <laughs> like the worst uh, maternal mortality and all these other yeah. things. Yeah, exactly. never get to those exactly. issues. Uh, folks, um, just a moment. We're going to be talking to Blake Emerson, assistant professor at the UCLA School of Law. You've heard me mention many, many times over the years, probably to the point of, uh, of nausea, the idea of the non-delegation uh, principle. And we are just about there, but we will get there in just a moment. First, a couple of words from our sponsors. Um, folks, you can get a free trial of Aura at Aura.com slash majority. Do you know what is the fastest growing crime in the United States? Identity theft. Okay, you do. I mean, you've heard this before. All right, but it's true. Uh, This crime rate has been surging, and it's been affecting millions of Americans. And as uh, Emma said, because she's heard me say it before, it's identity theft. I cheated, sorry. One in 20 Americans will deal with this. And despite that, those who've had their identity stolen are shocked when it happens. Everybody thinks it can't happen to me. But imagine for a moment, you try and log into your email account. The password's changed. Wait, what's going on? Uh, Then you start getting notifications of activity from your bank, your credit cards, crypto accounts. I mean, the the cascading uh, emotions. I had somebody break into my car uh, recently. And they didn't take anything. But it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. Because I was like, wait a second. Did I leave the car this much of a mess? And then all of a sudden, you start wondering, like, is this, did, did I do this? Did I un- keep the door unlocked? I mean, on and on, you, you, get, you get paranoid, you have anxiety, you're, you're, you're angry, you're frustrated, uh, guilt sets in. Um, so take care of your car. But in terms of your identity theft, this is where it can be a real problem. So, uh, which is why I'm happy to tell you uh, one of our new sponsors is Aura. They are sponsoring this show today. It's identity theft protection, fraud monitoring, a VPN, password management, and antivirus software um, all combined into one. It's an easy-to-use app. Aura monitors the dark web for your emails, passwords, and social security numbers and sends you alerts fast right to your phone and email. When it comes to fraud, every second matters. Connect your credit and bank accounts and get notified of any changes up to four times faster uh, than any of Aura's competitors. Their VPN allows you to stay anonymous online by keeping your browsing history and personal information safe and encrypted, and their antivirus software will block malware and viruses before they infect your devices. Uh, I, I, I put my email addresses in there. I use multiple email addresses, and bing, I immediately saw where uh, my email address and my, um, and my passwords had been compromised. Changed those, protected myself. You can protect you and your family from America's fastest growing crime. Try Aura for two weeks and see if any of you or your family's personal information has been compromised. You can check that out immediately during your free, free trial. And you can start it at Aura.com slash majority. Also, uh, 
another sponsor of today's program. We've had in the past other sheets. Uh, we had some issues with uh, the production uh, and, and whatnot. So I've been searching around for a new, um, a new sheets that I would love. And I have, to, I have to like the product before I will push it. And I will tell you this, I, I like these sheets before and over the past two days with the weather been like what it is, I am loving it. Cozy Earth has not only the softest, and I guess most luxurious, but for me, the big thing is temperature regulating sheets. I sleep hot. I don't like it. When it's hot out, I don't like it. These kept me cool. Cozy Earth has been featured on Oprah's most favorite things list for four years in a row. I don't know anything else on there, but I would actually look at that list just based upon uh, uh, Cozy. And while I'm fixing my camera, let me just say that I have a Cozy Earth duvet and comforter now for the summer. And I used to sweat like all the time. I'm a hot sleeper. Um, and it's bit done like it made a huge difference. And I don't have to like blast the AC. It's great. That could have been too much information. I didn't realize about the sweating that much. Okay, all right. Well, thousands of five star reviews. It's no wonder that Cozy Earth Sheets have become the bedding of choice for interior designers, celebrities, and excessive sweaters. Cozy Earth even <laughs> offers a hundred night sleep trial, which means you have up to a hundred nights to sleep on it. You can wash it, you try it out. If you're not completely in love, just send it back for a full refund. There's a 10 year warranty, and Cozy Earth Sheets come in four new colors. For a limited time, you can save 35% on Cozy Earth bedding. Check this out. Go to CozyEarth.com slash majority. Enter my special promo code majority at checkout. Save 35% off. That's CozyEarth.com slash majority. Be sure to enter majority at checkout for 35% off. And lastly, um, today's program also sponsored by Fiasco. It is a new Audible original podcast, and uh, I've mentioned this in the past. Fiasco is a documentary-style podcast. It's hosted by Leon Nefok. Uh, he is the co-creator and original host of Slow Burn. They did those seasons about Watergate and the Clinton impeachment, and if you like those, you're going to love Fiasco. Many times I've mentioned we have a problem with history in this country particularly even like recent history, because that is, it just seems more prone in some ways to being revised and used um, and used and leveraged in, in, in what we see in the news today. Each season of Fiasco goes deep on a huge important story from American history. It brings it back to life through original interviews and key players and witnesses. The newest season of Fiasco is all about the AIDS crisis. It's an attempt to re-examine and reckon with the last time a deadly virus transformed American society. All the uncertainty, fear, and prejudice that came with it, and horrible response by a lot of our people in government. So you can listen to a new season of Fiasco exclusively on Audible. Just go to audible.com slash, slash Fiasco Pod or text Fiasco Pod to 500 500. Okay, um, are we good? What's happening? We need to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Blake Emerson, assistant professor at the UCLA School of Law.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report here with Emma Vigeland on the phone. Blake Emerson, assistant professor at the UCLA School of Law, uh, joining us to talk about the Fifth Circuit's um, what, what you have written in Slate is an ambush against the SEC. Uh, you write that it's unprecedented and shocking. Uh, Blake, welcome to the program. Let's just start with, will you explain to people like what the Fifth Circuit is and where it fits in the context of our federal judiciary? Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. So the, the, the Fifth Circuit is an appellate court uh, that is, is an intermediary court between, between the district courts that usually hear cases uh, in the first instance and the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land. And the Fifth Circuit uh, just sits in Texas, and it covers a number of the southern states. And it's, it is, um, there is an inordinate amount of right-wing judges on the Fifth Circuit. I mean, maybe not relative to yeah. every, but, but in general, right? Yes, the Fifth Circuit is, is definitely one of the most, if not the most, uh, conservative courts in the, in the country, uh, particularly after the Trump administration, which... Uh, Trump added a number of, of judges to that circuit. Okay, and just one more point for, for folks who, who uh, just to remind them of sort of some of the remedials of this. Uh, yeah. The, an appellate court is, and, and probably the D.C. Circuit is probably the second most powerful court in the country, but the Fifth Circuit after that is like tied for third most important court in the country with the other um, uh, 12 circuits. And... Um, their responsibility, unlike the Supreme Court, they are specifically beholden to precedent. Is that right? Can you just articulate that dynamic before we get into the details here? That's right. Uh, so the, the Fifth Circuit is, is indeed one of the most important circuits in the country next to the D.C. Circuit, especially given the polit political dynamics today. And, and, and the Fifth Circuit is bound uh, by existing Supreme Court precedent. And, and a panel decision, such as the one that, that we're talking about today in Jarchese, a panel decision is also bound by the law of the circuit. So they have to follow the, the precedent in the circuit as well. Okay. And so uh, let's talk about Jarchese versus the Security Exchange Commission. Um, what, what are the, the facts of that case? So the, the facts of the case are that the, the Securities and Exchange Commission, which is an administrative agency, uh, created during the 1930s. The Securities and Exchange Commission uh, investigated and ultimately prosecuted George Jarchese for securities fraud. This had to do with uh, his management of a couple of hedge funds. And the basic idea was that he inflated, inflated the value of the assets in that security to prospective investors. And the SEC uh, prosecuted this case against Jarchese, not in a in a ordinary federal court, uh, but in a in a administrative court in front of the commission. So an SEC prosecutor uh, brings this case, and then an, an independent administrative law judge determined that Jarchese had indeed violated the securities laws and imposed a number of, of penalties and consequences on him. Why does the SEC do it that way? Why do they have an administrative judge um, as opposed to go into the I guess, the civil or the criminal um, uh, court system? Yeah, well, first of all, they, they're, they're able to do it because Congress explicitly gave them that choice. Uh, so the, 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 the relevant statutes say, SEC, look, you can either bring a case in federal court or you can bring a case before, uh, before the commission in these administrative adjudications. Uh, now, the, the reasons why an agency might choose to go with the, with the administrative court route uh, would be that it's, it's faster. Uh, it is, it, the, there, there, are fewer, uh, there are fewer procedural obstacles. And so uh, sometimes both, both the agency and the parties who are being sued might want speedier resolution of the claims. And, and administrative courts are well geared to do that. They also have specific procedures and evidentiary rules that are kind of tailored for the specific subject matter that the agencies are covering. And, um, and, and, and can someone be sent to jail from an administrative court? Uh, 
Gen- I mean, gener- not not in this area. There are in, in, in the context of immigration court, there can be there can be consequences of a criminal nature. Okay. But one thing I w- one thing I want to clarify is that even if you're going in the administrative court route, it's not the end of the line. Judicial review in a federal or an ordinary federal court is is generally available, and it certainly would have been available in this case. So if you're not happy with how things go, if Jarkazi is not happy with how things go at the SEC, he can appeal it to, say, the Fifth Circuit or to the D.C. Circuit. And, the, and those courts are going to review what the administrative court did and figure out whether it was lawful or not. Okay, so um, all right. So with all that said, uh, we can understand why Congress would want the administrative court because a they're going to be more familiar with the the intricacies of the SEC. They're going to be they're going to start the ground running. Judges don't, you know, judges read into stuff and maybe they get a certain type of uh, cases and this and that. But an administrative court associated with the SEC is going to understand the the SEC and hedge funds and all of the financial instruments in in a much better way but of course it's up to review. Okay, so what did the 5th circuit do here? Well, so the, the 5th circuit in a, a pretty remarkable and shocking opinion concluded that the SEC's adjudication authority and maybe its enforcement authority as a whole was unconstitutional. And on on three different independent bases. Uh, and, you know, I'm happy to go more into the details on that without getting us into, you know, my full administrative law course. I, w- uh, I would love course. for you to go into the full administrative yeah. law course. I am still technically on sabbatical <laughs> from BU law. It's year 30 for me on my sabbatical. But if I can get course credits, I'll take it. I'm ha- happy to help out as much as I can with that. Um, well, I mean, the, the, the headline of is, is that there are three different bases. So the first uh, the, the, the first of these claims was that it's unconstitutional. It's a violation of the right to a jury trial for an administrative court to impose a civil penalty or a fine. Uh, and so in this case, the SEC imposed a, a $300,000 fine in addition to some other, other consequences that weren't technically penalties, but nonetheless had you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in consequences for, for Jarkazi. And the court said that's a violation of the right to a jury trial. Uh, that that view is a significant departure from Supreme Court precedent. So there are a number of cases that establish that an administrative agency can impose civil penalties, including civil civil penalties that involve uh, common law rights like property and contract and issues around fraud. Uh, They can do that as long as it's really essential to the agency's regulatory purpose or the regulatory scheme that that Congress implemented. Now, uh, it's certainly been of interest on the right um, amongst the conservative legal movement to try to restrict that power, uh, but it would be a, a major change in precedent. And I think it, it's fair to say the Fifth Circuit was coloring outside the lines in, in claiming that this result was required by existing precedent. If the Fifth precedent, if the Fifth Circuit um, uh, um, opinion on this was to be the law of the land, could you have EPA fines if I dump uh, chemicals into the water? Yeah, well, that's that's a great example because yes, EPA has authority to issue civil penalties too. And if the Supreme Court adopted this holding from from the Fifth Circuit, it would most likely also wipe out those sorts of EPA authorities, which, as you say, is that you know you you dump a chemical into 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 the river you know you it, it, it's currently the case that the EPA can impose a civil penalty on you in administrative adjudication uh, that wouldn't probably wouldn't be the case anymore likewise if you have some kind of you know device at your factory that's spewing harmful chemicals into the air today the EPA can impose a civil penalty uh, that that authority would probably get wiped out if the Supreme Court adopted that that holding amongst these three different unconstitutional bases. If I was to go into a, let's say I'm the FDA and I go into a factory and I say, this factory needs to shut down right now uh, because let's say there's bacteria here and you guys are, um, you guys are putting this into your baby formula. You need to shut this down. Couldn't they say like, well, this is a, this is tantamount to a fine. We're losing money. You don't have the authority to do this under the ruling that was back. You know, I'm, again, we're, the hypothetical is yeah. that the Fifth Circuit's right. holding is 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 in, is um, uh, agreed to by the Supreme Court. Does the FDA have the ability to shut that that down? Well, 
I mean, so so that that's a good question. It, that whether the EPA or sorry, whether the FDA can go in and investigate um, and allege that your factory is in trouble. Now that 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 that's a different question. But if the F, if the FDA can actually conclusively close the plant, like if we're dealing with the the, the baby formula issue, for example, yeah, this this opinion would cut back. FDA's ability to shut down the plant without first running to court and getting a court order that says you got to do it, right? So, you know, FDA didn't have to do that with regards to the Abbott, La- Abbott Laboratories, you know, baby food situation. Uh, this opinion cuts at basically agencies' uh, power to enforce the law expediently against firms and individuals who are posing really pressing problems to public health and safety. And, and and I just gave two, you know, two examples that I think are sort of like the yeah. low hanging fruit ones. But there are, this is all over the place. Lots of examples. I mean, this Lots is of examples. The, well, this is the part when we actually talk about government, which is ex- mostly what we're talking about when we talk about government. For sure. Yeah. So, you know, you, the, the list of agencies that have these sorts of powers is is vast. I mean, so you can talk about the, cons- the, uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which has been a particular boogeyman for the Fifth Circuit and the Supreme Court. You, you can think about the National Labor Relations Board, and you can think about the Federal Trade Commission. And when you look at that list of agencies, you can so kind in of other words, I just wanted going, to say this yeah, because we ahead. talked about this. We've talked about this almost every day. When the National Labor Relations Board says to Starbucks, "Hey, you illegally fired these workers. You need to rehire them." Or uh, you need to have another vote like that. That authority gone with you know, where they could say that they would have to go to court. Starbucks would would uh, would take uh, billions of dollars worth of, of lawyers and tie the whole thing up. Nothing would ever happen. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so there, there is a question uh, about whether so th- this ruling uh, claims to be limited to cases where an agency is imposing something that looks like a, a common law. Uh, penalty as opposed to an equitable penalty. And so, you know, the next line of defense for people who are going to try to, you know, rescue the, as much of administrative law as they can will be to say, hey, it's okay for agencies like the NLRB to say cease and desist or you got to pay back pay because those are formally different from a civil penalty. Um, whether or not that kind of distinction is going to hold up over time if the court goes in this direction. Uh, I'm dubious. Right. Okay. So you said three, uh, you said three respects. The first respect was, was that, what are the other two? Right. Okay. So the next one, and, and I'll just say off the bat, this is the, this is the most outlandish in, in stiff competition. The next one is that it violated the non-delegation doctrine for Congress to give the Securities and Exchange Commission the choice between either going to court to enforce the law or proceeding in an administrative adjudication. And uh, I'll just give a little bit of background on this non-delegation doctrine. So the non-delegation doctrine is a judicially created constitutional rule. It's not doesn't say this in the Constitution, uh, but the, it says that Congress cannot delegate to the executive branch its authority to make the law. And this rule has only been deployed to strike down a federal statute three times in history, uh, in 1935 and 1936, when a conservative Supreme Court was trying to stop the New Deal. And since then, it's and, and, long and, been And Professor, let me, just, let, me just, let me just want to be yeah. clear so that people understand the sort of the legal, legal vernacular here. When you say this is a yeah. rule, we should say it's a made-up rule. It's, a, it's not yeah. it's not a rule like in the way that we perceive like, a, you know, um, in science. It's not even a rule that any body, elected body, has ever, ever promulgated. It is a theory or just that somebody uh, that some legal uh, some justices, some right wing justices from the Lochner era came up with and said, we're going to call it a rule. In the same way that, like, you know, I don't know, during wiffle ball, if me and uh, my buddy decide this is a rule, then it's a rule. And that's it. So the, the, Supreme, the, the, the Constitution, if you look at the text of the Constitution, says nothing about a non-delegation doctrine. Uh, the only constitutional foundation for it is just the fact that the Constitution vests 
gives the legislative power to Congress. It doesn't say anything about whether Congress can give it away or anything like that, or the terms under which it can delegate power. It doesn't say anything about that. And there's been a lot of really great recent historical research by people like Nick, uh, Nicholas Perillo and Julian Mortensen and Nick Bagley, who found that even if you're an originalist, even if you buy this theory that we have to read the Constitution the way, the way, it, the way it would have been read back in 1789, there was no basis for it back then. Uh, but yes, you know, in, in, in the New Deal, the court, the court invoked this, this idea that Congress can't give away too much power, basically, to the executive branch. Um, and, you know, when I was in law school, like, I don't know, at this point, a decade ago, uh, you know, my law professor, uh, my administrative law professor, and I think most people would have said this, said it was dead. The non allegation doctrine is dead. It's never coming back. They said that because Justice Scalia uh, in 2001 uh, concluded that it, it didn't apply in a case where, you know, where, where, where you would have thought maybe Justice Scalia would go for it. So everyone thought it was gone. But now that the court has gone so far to the right. There's been a lot of interest in reviving this, this, this made-up doctrine uh, in order to rein in uh, the, the regulatory state and diminish the powers of the federal government uh, to promote the public interest. Blake, when I've mentioned the non-delegation um, uh, rule or principle or theory or made-up uh, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> thing that it is, um, I, the example I use is— um, Congress doesn't, you know, Congress says to um, the EPA, we, we're passing a law. You have responsibility for making sure that water is drinkable and healthy for human beings. And in 1975, yeah. our knowledge of science is such that you only need, you know, you, you, you have to exclude mercury. You have to exclude lead. But... We don't even know at that point, maybe, that benzodiazepanzazine exists. And it's not until right. it's not until like 1990 that the EPA stumbles across it or is aware that some fracker is using it and it's in the water and says, hey, this stuff is actually also carcinogenic or whatever. And so that can't right. be in this either. Under the non-delegation principle, would it be the case that Congress actually has to say like, oh, no, we need to now outlaw that? specific chemical we can't just say generally it's up to the epa to determine what constitutes water that is like drinkable by humans uh we need to outline each exact chemical that should or should not be in it yes that's the, that's the idea now i mean one of the problems with the non-delegation rule is that it's incredibly vague so it's actually unclear what exactly congress would have to do to clear the bar. Uh, but yeah, what it does is it, it basically tells Congress, you have to get incredibly specific. And the reason that's so debilitating is that, as you say, Congress is trying to solve big social, economic, environmental problems that change over time. And it's really hard to legislate. And so, yeah, you're trying to make the air clean. You're trying to make the water clean. You're trying to prevent securities fraud. You're trying to prevent monopolies. But what, what that requires at any given point in time is going to change. And so it's, it's impossible for Congress to tell, to tell agencies exactly what they have to do because things are going to change. But frankly, uh, you know, and a, a, yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, it just it allows for special interests in Congress to because it, I mean, it's already impossible for the Senate to pass anything past the filibuster. If you have a group of right. uh, if you have a group of senators that band together and decide we're going to sink this and we're going to allow you know whatever carcinogen from uh this as to use sam's example this fracking offshoot it makes it a lot easier uh to 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 hold those things up as opposed to having actual experts decide for sure yes it creates all kinds of op opportunities for mischief in the legislative process it also makes compromise much harder because it might be easier to get people to agree on the general principle of saying, you know, let's have, let's make sure the air is as clean as it can be in a feasible way. It's harder to say, okay, we have to agree on a list of a thousand chemicals that we think are banned, especially when you have special interests that have, you know, have a lot at stake financially in being able to continue using things like, you know, benzene or, you know, stuff that causes cancer. And so, and, you know, and, you know, we're, this is not, it's not a hypothetical, you know, we, we have a, 
we have a case before the court right now about EPA's authority to regulate climate change. Right. And uh, and the court is is considering right now going to hand down an opinion probably in the next 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 few days or weeks uh, about whether and to what extent EPA can do that. And it's possible they'll just you know wipe out part of the Clean Air Act relying on the non-delegation doctrine or relying on techniques of statutory interpretation that do pretty much the same thing as the non-delegation doctrine. Okay, so Blake, what's the third um, sort of element of this uh, uh, of this ruling? Okay, so the third the third holding was that the adjudicators, these these guys uh, guys and gals called administrative law judges, who um, who adjudicate cases before the SEC, that they were unconstitutionally. Uh, unconstitutionally uh, prevented from, sorry, I'm, I'm putting this in a confusing way. Uh, let me explain. The, these administrative law judges are protected from being fired uh, for political reasons. So the president or the president's appointees aren't allowed to say, hey, I don't like the way, I don't like your politics. I don't like the political consequences of this ruling, so I'm going to fire you. That's not allowed with regard to administrative law judges because they're supposed to be impartial. They're supposed to render decisions based on what the statute says. Um, and the court ruled here that those, those four cause or good cause removal protections that prevent them from being fired uh, were unconstitutional because there were two layers, <laughs> two layers of, of four cause removal protection. Um, and just like with the non-delegation doctrine, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that, that Congress is not allowed to impose four cause removal protections or two layers of four cause removal protections. But there's this n another invented constitutional theory that's cashed out in particular rules called the unitary executive theory that says the president has to be able to order around, direct, supervise, and fire everyone in the executive branch. And this is a theory that's been, in, you know, in the been cooked up since the late 1970s and 1980s in the Justice Departments of the Ford administration and the Reagan administration by people like uh, the late Justice Scalia to say Congress, even if it wants to protect adjudicators from being impartial and politicized, it can't do it because that interferes with the president's executive power. And uh, the court, the Fifth Circuit in this case, is building off that unitary executive argument to strike at the independence of the civil service in this case. And, and people should be aware that at that point, you know, when Donald Trump uh, becomes president again or Tom Cotton, they will fire yeah. all of the immigration administrative uh, uh, and, and put in just a bunch of like uh, the, I don't know, uh, the interns at the Federalist Society and uh, or the Heritage Foundation. And that'll be that uh, for those uh, years. Um, and we, and I should also add, uh, Dick Cheney was probably the the most, I think, well known um, uh, uh, supporter of the unitary executive theory. I think he may have even cooked it up uh, at his time uh, with with Nixon. Um, all right. Well, so yeah. all right. Yeah, I, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry, Blake. Well, so I mean, so I should clear. I mean, just to, just to clarify. So it's not true that every administrative adjudicator in the executive branch has these protections, um, and arguably they should. But, you know, immigration is actually an example where currently those judges can be, be fired. They're not as well protected as the administrative law judges at the Securities and Exchange Commission or in the Social Security Administration. Um, but that's actually a great example of the problem, which is that those the, that system is highly politicized and, is, and, and shifts wins a lot. From, from administration to administration. And the Trump administration at the very end of his term, he tried to reclassify huge parts of the civil service so that he could fire all of them, right. anyone who had policy responsibilities. And if he had gotten a second term, he would have done it. And this opinion is pushing in that same direction to basically deprive our government of, of objective expertise and professionals who are making decisions based on their knowledge of what's going on, as opposed to whatever whatever the, the head honcho says is, is the best politics. Okay, so lastly, Blake, what happens now? Um, the Fifth Circuit has determined that yeah. if I live in, you know, Texas and Louisiana and any part of that region, uh, this is the law of the land now there, correct? And, un, until it goes to yeah. the Supreme Court or the, extreme, the, the Supreme Court 
hypothetically yeah. in their shadow docket could enjoin it from happening, but they're not going to do that. I mean, so what happens next uh, from a mechanical standpoint? Last question. Yeah. So this, uh, so this is not, this was not an opinion. There have been some of these, uh, some of these outlandish opinions out of the fifth circuit and other places that have imposed nationwide injunctions, basically saying you can't, uh, you can't do X, Y, and Z anymore. Uh, like you, you can't, you, you can't have a, um, you can't have a, a policy that's uh, protecting people, uh, undocumented immigrants from deportation, for example. This, that's not what happened in this case. In this case, the Fifth Circuit uh, basically uh, vacated the ruling with regard to George Jarkazi in particular without actually taking away the SEC structures entirely. Um, but, the, the, but if that holding stands up, it's going to have the consequence that the SEC is, is constitutionally uh, void or at least vulnerable in, in certain key respects with regard to its enforcement powers, and that could be applied to other agencies. As far as this case in particular, uh, the, the Fifth Circuit will have the opportunity to take this decision on banc, which means that instead of a three-judge panel, which is who ruled in this case, it could go before the whole Fifth Circuit, and they could decide whether or not um, it, you know, the, 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 this opinion was rightly decided. And, um, you know, again, the Fifth Circuit as a whole is still very conservative. So, you know, that's not a whole lot of whole lot of security in that possibility. And ultimately, this case can get appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, you know, I, I may decide it wants to take it. Uh, and if if it if it decides that it wants to uphold any one of these three conclusions, that the SEC's authorities are unconstitutional, it's going to have major destructive consequences for, for federal government regulation and for the welfare state as a whole. And I'll ju I just want to you know, point out, this is a, this, this, just for your, for your listeners, this is a, a, a big front in what's happening in this legal battle right now, which is that the, the, the Republican Party and the conservative legal movement's opposition to the welfare state and opposition to federal regulation often takes the form of making these procedural objections. So it's right. hard to get Congress. It's hard to get Congress to get rid of the, secu the securities laws because people understand that securities fraud is a bad thing. It's hard to get Congress to get rid of the Clean Air Act. It's easier once you've stacked the bench with the with with right wing justices to get them to say, look, various ways these agencies act are unconstitutional. Yeah. And that accomplishes the same result. Well, Blake Emerson, assistant professor at the UCLA School of Law, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. Okay, uh, next up, um, we're ready to go. I want to welcome back to the program Leah Littman. She's an assistant professor at the Michigan uh, Law School uh, here to uh, talk about a, a, a constitutional right that has been gutted by the Supreme Court. Um, Leah, just... This has got to be, uh, I, I got to imagine, I'm here with Emma Viglund, I, I got to imagine, like, and, and I know that you have been obviously following the, the, the Fifth Circuit um, uh, case as well. Um, th this is, uh, I, I don't know that in our modern era, right, uh, we have seen the, and I, I will include like the sort of the diminishment of the Supreme, uh, of, of, of the Voting Rights Act and what appears to be the, the total reversal of a woman's right to have an abortion in this country. Like there's been nothing like this. It feels like in, in the history of our judicial system, um, it, it maybe since like maybe the Lochner era, but maybe even, maybe not even ever in the history of the country, right. Where we're starting to see rollbacks of these things. I think this court is exceptionally aggressive in the number of issues it is reaching out to decide how extremely and aggressively it is deciding them. And it is issuing rulings that just have profound consequences on so many different people's lives, in addition to the basic structure of our government. You know, you were just talking about the Fifth Circuit decision. You know, last week, the court gutted uh, another provision of what remains of our campaign finance law. This week, the court made it impossible to enforce your Sixth Amendment right to counsel. If you are accused at trial, the court is poised to roll back a woman's right to decide to have an abortion. I mean, the list goes on and on. Next year, they are poised to dismantle a 
affirmative action and race conscious remedies. Um, soon they are poised to basically make it impossible for states to restrict open carry laws. I mean, this court is moving at an extremely rapid pace to refashion government and society in all of the ways the Republican Party wants to and isn't able to do in the electoral process. Is there, I mean, I mean, just as, as just a point of history, like I mean, if, if you if you see the Voting Rights Act reversals, starting with Section five and then we're now in Section two and um, and we consider the the right to vote uh, to be a right that was frankly codified by the 1965 Voting Rights Act or strengthened, I guess that's been rolled back by this court. Um, the right to choose is going to be rolled back by this court. I don't know if there's anything that even remotely is there even can you even come up with an analogy in American history for the rollbacks and rights that we're seeing here? You talk about the Sixth Amendment. We're going to talk about that in, uh, in just a moment. But I mean, is there is there anything even remotely analogous in any other period of American history? I think the most analogous period would be the period immediately following Reconstruction and the Civil War, which is sometimes known as redemption. During that time, you know, a Southern slaveholder sympathetic Supreme Court dismantled the protections for newly freed slaves um, that the Reconstruction Congress had enacted and narrowly read the Reconstruction Amendments that were designed to protect the rights of newly freed slaves. You know, that court struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875, made it prohibitive difficult to enforce federal civil rights laws and was dismantling rights that were protected by statute and by constitution in a way that compounded disadvantage that I think resembles the period we are in today. And Leah, just uh, because this is your area of expertise, I'm just wondering if you can shed light on how um, this conservative effort to stack the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but federal courts with uh, judges that are ideologically uh, disciplined and are on their side, how much this is really a culmination of that multi-decade effort, frankly, um, to, to cement the courts and ensure that a, a, a good majority um, of them, at least, are in conservative hands? This is a product of I would say four decades of work by the conservative legal movement and the Republican Party, not just to focus on the courts, but to focus on every single lever of political power. And that includes the courts. They took every opportunity they could to block Democrats from exercising political power, including by appointing judges to the federal courts. They took every opportunity they had to exercise political power to give themselves the greatest possible advantage, including by appointing judges who would make it easier for Republicans to exercise political power by allowing them to engage in partisan gerrymandering, by dismantling campaign finance regulations and allow them to curry favor with corporations that would in, you know, spend a ton of money in elections in order to ensure that Republicans retain political power. So this is the product of a several decades long movement. I think progressives need to wake up to that reality. There is no simple fix that is going to happen tomorrow. This is a long fight that is going to take decades, and it involves paying attention to every single election, including state and local elections for the next several decades, electing people who will be the new leaders of the political party, giving them the reins to exercise political power to the maximum possible advantage for Democrats' political agenda. These are things that just have to be done. All right, let's 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 talk specifically about uh, this Sixth Amendment, because um, this is, um, in, in some ways, you know, um, uh, we'd interviewed a writer in Boston, Natalie Scher, who was talking about the uh, Roe v. Wade reversal, the imminent uh, reversal that I think we're going to see as a class issue insofar as um, it is going to have, in terms of like material impact, um, and inc the, the, the material impact on, uh, on women Half of the women who get abortions uh, uh, make less than eighteen thousand dollars a year, and it's it, it is in very much at least until they, until a Republican um, a government passes a, a, a federal ban, uh, it's going to be very much a um, a, a reversal that is going to impact low income women. 
this um, this is a similar dynamic, it seems to me, when we talk about this uh, this case, Shin versus Martinez Ramirez. Um, these are two cases that have been combined um, and at the Supreme Court because they are similarly situated. Explain to us what the, the, the facts and the dynamic of the case is here. The basic issue in the case is whether if the state appoints you a crappy lawyer at your trial and then appoints you another crappy lawyer later on to argue that your first lawyer was crappy, are you basically out of luck? Like that is the gist of the case. The way this works is, you know, the Sixth Amendment guarantees you the effective assistance of counsel at your trial. But if you were denied the effective assistance of counsel at your trial, you need to be able to raise that claim at some later stage in the proceeding. The point at which that happens is what's known as post-conviction proceedings. But sometimes maybe even often, states will appoint underfunded, overworked, underqualified lawyers to represent indigent defendants in post-conviction proceedings. Those lawyers won't investigate the case. They won't uncover the evidence that your lawyer was ineffective. They might not uncover the evidence that you're innocent of the crime. That's what happened here. Arizona appointed an ineffective lawyer for Barry Jones at his trial. They appointed another ineffective lawyer to represent him during post-conviction proceedings. Neither of those lawyers investigated the state's theory of the crime or Barry Jones' possible innocence. So when Barry Jones got to federal court and was finally represented by federal defenders, they uncovered mountains of evidence that debunked the state's theory of the crime and proved it could not have happened at the time the state said it did. And the Supreme Court in Shin versus um, Martinez Ramirez says, you can't introduce that evidence in federal court. If you're too poor to afford your own lawyer, it's your fault. Your lawyer's mistakes are your own. I mean, this is just, it is unbelievable. I mean, because this is like one of those things where you don't need to have a back a background in in the law to understand how incredibly unfair this is. We have a constitutional right. So they're basically saying like your constitutional right only existed in the first time that you're represented. The constitution explicitly says you have to have an effective uh, a lawyer in the first instance. But in any subsequent um, situation to prove that you had an ineff- you don't need to have an effective lawyer, which basically means that you're, there's no way for you to prove that you had an ineffective lawyer. And even in this instance where by chance it was able to go to a federal court. Now, in the future, will there be an opportunity for someone to go to that federal court? No, because they don't have a right to make that appeal. They don't have the right to introduce any evidence. If they are in federal court and their lawyers want to introduce evidence, the Supreme Court has just told them, you can't do that. You can't hold an evidentiary hearing. You can't gather evidence to support your claim. It is astonishing. And while, of course, I agree with you that the Sixth Amendment guarantees the right to counsel, I would just note that at least one justice, the justice who happened to author this opinion, Justice Clarence Thomas, has questioned whether the Sixth Amendment actually does guarantee the right to appointed counsel for those people who cannot afford one. So the Supreme Court is making it impossible to enforce that right. Some of the justices have openly questioned whether that right even exists. This is the path we are headed down. Um, it, 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 it sort of reminds me, there was a, uh, there was a case, I think the Supreme Court looked at, uh, under the Voting Rights Act about, uh, Texas's maps, first set of maps had been deemed to be racist. And then they went back and essentially another, the ones who developed it in the Texas legislature were deemed to have done it for racist reasons. That legislature changed because a, a, a term went by and they adopted the same map. But the Supreme Court said it's no longer racist because they didn't do it. And so they couldn't have done it for racist reasons, even though they just adopted the same map that was deemed originally racist. Like there's a sort of there's a, a gaping loophole here that how do you prove that you had ineffective and, and yes, Thomas doesn't think that maybe you should deserve that representation. But there's no this is a this is like a this is like a maze that doesn't have an exit. 
Yes, it is Kafkaesque. You know, the Supreme Court has made it impossible to enforce one of the most fundamental rights, you know, a right that protects all other rights. It is your right to counsel that allows you to enforce your other constitutional rights. It's your lawyer, after all, who would object to if the state is trying to introduce unconstitutionally obtained evidence or if the state is trying to coerce a confession or if the state is trying to introduce a flawed lineup. It's your lawyer who is supposed to be able to protect all of those rights. And it's your right to a lawyer that the Supreme Court has made it impossible to enforce. Um, and, and this, of course, is going to impact people who don't have the money to, uh, to purchase, uh, you know, a, a, a competent legal um, representation. Um, yes. It, go ahead. Sorry. I, I, yes. I, there's no question, you know, this is a major um, battle axe against, you know, indigent criminal defense. Well, to bring it back to just the point you brought up, Natalie Schur, and how she was speaking about the road decision uh, at our Boston show in terms of class, um, this is a major through line for the Supreme Court as well, or this modern conservative Supreme Court. Money equals speech, <laughs> um, and you can only like, participate in the... Uh, or people who have more money have an outsized influence, and that's been buttressed by this uh, Ted Cruz decision in our elections. And if you have more money, we're going to codify that as constitutional, um, that you're, uh, the people with more money are entitled to uh, better and more adequate legal representation. And, uh, you know, that's what Thomas's opinion solidifies. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're poor, it's your fault. Um, if you're not poor, you get to buy your way into politics. Speaking of buying your way into politics, let's just talk briefly about this, um, uh, the case that Ted Cruz bought, uh, brought um, uh, to the court. He, um, he specifically violated uh, a um, Federal Elections Committee Commission uh, rule, I guess, a regulation, um, and did so so that he could test, go to the Supreme Court and test this rule. Will you explain this case to us? Yes, absolutely. So um, it's a challenge to a federal statute that prohibits a political candidate from using more than $250,000 in post-election contributions, contributions after an election, to repay personal loans by the candidate. So again, what you can't do is use more than a quarter of a million dollars in money given after an election to repay a personal loan to the candidate, to give money directly to the candidate effectively. Okay, and so here's the scenario. I, uh, I run for Congress, I, I lose or I win, doesn't matter. And um, I had uh, loaned myself on the campaign, I dug in deep into my podcast savings and I loaned myself a million dollars. But I need this money back obviously and um, a million dollars, I'm going to charge me 25% interest on that million dollars, actually, uh, because that's a lot of money. In fact, it's, uh, uh, let's just call it 25%. And so uh, I run, I win, and now I've got this loan, and I go to uh, George Soros, who is a big fan of the show, and I say, I need that, uh, I need to, to pay off this loan. And it's not just a million dollars, it's also the interest. So it's like, I don't know. I can't, uh, for the sake of my my poor math skills, it's really one point two million dollars at this point. And George Soros goes, "Of course, Sam. Whenever you call, I always answer the phone and I always write a check." And he gives me one point two million dollars. And so I made some cash. I've got it from George Soros, and all good, right? I mean, according to the Supreme Court now. Yes, exactly. And the Supreme Court's decision to strike down the statute rested on what I think are just two lies or fictions. One is the idea that repaying the loan didn't actually give the candidate anything. It didn't make the candidate richer because you were just giving the candidate back money they already had. But that ignores the fact that once the candidate loaned the money to their campaign, they didn't have the money anymore. Now, all of a sudden, you do have $1 million that you didn't have before, in addition to whatever interest you know, you charging the campaign. But the Supreme Court insisted, you're not actually giving money to the candidate or making it any richer. And then second, the Supreme Court said the government had not identified any specific instances of quid pro quo corruption, that is, 
specific examples where a donor said, if I give you a million dollars, will you vote for or against this legislation? But it's really hard to identify specific instances of quid pro quo corruption. You know, these aren't conversations happening out in the open. People aren't writing them down. You know, they're following the Stringer Bell advice, you know, not taking notes on a conspiracy. And so this legislation responded to the very real risk that, again, once a candidate is elected, they're in a totally different position where a donor can and they have a sure bet. They can buy them off and they can give them money directly. And that just creates too great a risk of influence, access, and corruption, which the Supreme Court described as features of our democracy rather than as problems. And we should say, obviously, this is, again, uh, a, a huge boon to wealthy people who want to run for Congress because other wealthy people who contribute money to a congressional race or to a senatorial race or to a presidential race if you can assure them that you're going to win, they're going to be much more inclined to contribute. And if you've already won and it's after the fact, you can assure them that you've won. And so they're going to be much more inclined to contribute. I mean, so this is like, this is just sort of, you know, a guaranteed, uh, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I, I, I mean, it, it's, it's hilariously corrupt. Yes, it's really quite appalling. I mean, no one is as stupid as the Supreme Court wrote this opinion to seem. You know, you're not making anyone richer by repaying a loan. Come on. You know, the government can't point to specific examples of quid pro quo corruption, and there's nothing to worry about donors being able to give money directly to someone who's just been elected to office. Come I on. mean, this just happened in the pandemic. The the PPP loans made a lot of people richer by, I mean, uh, and and there there was all this discussion. We can't give people, you know, more payments to not work. Well, a lot of business owners got richer off those PPP loans, didn't have to pay them back. Le, uh, le, what, wasn't there a case to, there's nothing to, and there's nothing to inhibit me charging myself 25%. Right. I mean, like I could charge. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, if I'm making a loan to myself from the campaign and presumably I either chair the campaign or I know the chair of the campaign because I appointed them the chair of the campaign. And I'm going to say, like, I'm going to loan my uh, campaign a million dollars. And you know what? hundred percent interest. I need the money. I need the money for the campaign, but I really don't want to give the money to, to myself. So I'm going to charge hundred percent interest. And I get to the other side of the campaign, I've won, and I go to Soros, and again, he always answers my phone calls, and whatever I say, he does. There's nothing inhibiting him to giving me $2 million back, right? Like an extra million. You know what, Sam? You drove a hard bargain when you loaned the money to your campaign, a 100% loan. And then theoretically, couldn't I also say like, okay, it's a 10% loan, but of the day after I win, I go, there's a penalty. Uh, it's actually bumps up to a thousand percent interest. I know campaign, that's rough uh, terms, but that's what I, that's what it is. And I've made that agreement with me and my chair in person. <laughs> I mean, like then George Soros come in and give me like, you know what? Here's, here's 10 million. Here's a billion dollars. I mean, isn't, is that, that seems to be completely legitimate at this point. That is apparently a feature of our democracy, not a bug. Well, I wish I had that cash because I would start to maybe figure out a way in which to uh, maybe I, maybe, I run scheme, for, yeah. maybe could I run for like a different office or something to that effect? I don't know one would that would have that value. But Leah Lippman, um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I, I have a feeling we'll be talking to you about more of these just it, 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 just almost incomprehensible uh a uh, degradation of our of our of our our whole legal structure in this country. I really appreciate it. Anytime. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> it's not going to stop anytime soon. <laughs> no. All right, folks. Um I I, I mean I, I there I, I it is so enraging to me and um I really don't know how to express this for the better part of the the past the, the past well certainly the past decade but uh, you know 12 years we've been doing the show and one of the um one of the the 
sort of primary themes that that uh, we've been hitting on the show is the importance of the uh, judiciary. And it is hard to express the level of neglect that Democrats, leftists, what, what, you know, progressives, um, liberals have have exhibited towards the courts. Um, in some instances, that neglect has actually been active and hostile to any message about the courts. Um, I've had ding dongs on here who are like, blah, 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 you know, uh, Michigan uh, moon falling into the lake and this and that. And every, and, and I've also had people who said like, you know, F the courts, we don't need them. And it's like, well, that's, that's true, but they exist. And, um, the ability of our government to do anything of which we think is a value is on the precipice of being torn down. And um, I honestly don't know what the solution is to how you stop this other than, you know, uh, to begin committed to at least making people understand these things. And there needs to be a serious mechanism, not like uh, just within democratic circles, but on the left to actually, you know, have litmus tests for uh, for liberal Supreme or liberal court appointees, uh, judges, et cetera. There's no discipline. We're not even, but we're not even at the point where people understand. Like, I, I can tell you that right right now that no one who doesn't work in finance is going to be aware of the implications of these SEC rulings. No one who doesn't work in environmental protection is going to be aware of the fact that at one point, like, the EPA doesn't have the ability to make sure that your water's clean. The, the way that you're going to find out is five years down the road, we're going to see a higher rate of cancer or we're going to see a higher rate of, of a certain disease, people who live in certain areas. And it's going to take another five or ten years if people put that together. You're going to see... Two kids die because of the the uh, the, the formula. What well, you're going to see five years down the road, it's just you know, several hundred kids a year die from it. Also, uh, more people get uh, sick with food poisoning. I mean, this is this is what this is the way it will go, and it'll be very hard to communicate. Like these things are not just random acts. These things are not coincidences. This is a concerted effort to allow corporations and money to essentially privatize their profits and socialize the costs. And the way that they socialize the costs, they spread it out in such a way that you can't see it. It is a hidden fee that you are paying in misery, in lack of health, in shortened lifespans, and it probably costs money, too, associated with all of that. And um, this is all, 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 all a function of our court system is going to inhibit these things. And on top of it, on top of it, the courts are also functioning to make sure that even if there is an awareness amongst Democrats that, hey, wait a second, we need to start organizing it to, that it makes it that much harder to get into an electoral position where you can appoint these judges. I mean, that's why I will well, say the, this. The, it's a, it's a two-pronged approach. They're stacking the courts and they're gerrymandering so that on the state level and then, of course, on the federal level, it's just completely tilted in, the other, in, in their direction. So, you know, when we say, like, the, maintaining the Senate is, is so huge in 2022... It is, that's an understatement. The idea that Joe Biden would have the opportunity to appoint maybe another 100, 150 federal judges, maybe another Supreme Court justice, probably not, but maybe, versus Donald Trump putting in that next 150 after he had just done a couple hundred. It's huge. 
We're already seeing it. We could, I mean, we could arguably be past the point of no return. But um, to the extent that um, that we're not, the, the, the Senate becomes so, so important. Can't overstate that. Can't. Uh, that's why, like, you know, just even like us, you know, cheering on uh, Dr. Oz and McCormick, you know, going deep yes. into the vote counts, like literally every day that that eats up a moment of their ability to go into the general election, the better. I mean, the the idea that like maybe there'll be some resentment from Purdue Kemp. Um, well, that's a governor's race, but nevertheless, Stacey Abrams wins. Warnock's going to win. Right. I mean, that this is, you know, the value of even like a congressional race in these um, uh, states where there is a, a Senate race is not even the con congressional race as much as it is that their ability to get more voters to the polls. who are going to pull that the D lever for the Senate race. Tim Ryan versus J.D. Vance. Yes. And so every, you know, every race that is congressional or state race where Democrats running and can bring out four extra voters helps Tim Ryan in that race. And, and you can tell me, you, you can tell me the worst thing possible about Tim Ryan. And all I can tell you is that if he makes the 50th Senator on the Democratic side, then it's worth it. Period. End of story. Um, that's how important the judiciary is particularly now. Frankly, we're lucky that, um, you know, in Georgia, there's a, gonna, there's a gubernatorial race this time around. Absolutely, because Stacey Abrams is going to bring out, I yeah. mean, it, it's, it's going to be a big boon. It's going to be a big boon. And there boon. need to be more Stacey Abrams across the country, candidates that may not actually win, but, I mean, she could win this time around, but regarding last time, who set up infrastructure for other candidates so that, there isn't just like a building of things from scratch when we're in a dire situation like we're in right now. C. Biddy is asking me, can the person who loans the money decide not to seek repayment of the loan too? How the F is this legal? No, no, no. It's not even a, a repayment of the loan. It's a campaign contribution. So I loan myself the money for my campaign. I charge me 100% interest. I call up George Soros, one of my uh, big donors. And, and best friends. And you know, maybe I don't even call him up. Maybe I'm just like I'm over, we're having uh, tea, and uh, I'm over there, you know, to play tennis or whatever it is at his house. <laughs> and uh, I say, George, uh, my campaign is in the hole, well, a million dollars, and then plus the 100% uh, interest that I charge on that loan to myself. So really, it's two million bucks. Uh, what do you say you whip out your checkbook and make a $2 million donation to my campaign? I've already won. So yeah, the return on the investment is going to be there. Not to say that there's a quid pro quo. We would never say that. I'm just saying. The return on the investment. Yeah. Wouldn't you want to contribute to a guy that you know is definitely going to be in Congress? And of course, George is like, you had me at hello. Hello. And signs, and that's it. All right. Um, we're going to head into the fun half where we will probably all uh, take out a blunt instrument and uh, let the uh, blood drain from our veins. I thought you were going to stop at blunt, but. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Folks, it's your support that makes Only this show possible. One. Yeah, exactly. It's your support that makes this show possible. Uh, when you become a member of the Majority Report, you not only get the free show, free commercials, you get the fun half. A reminder, if you're watching on YouTube, it will automatically populate. But if you want to watch later uh, the fun half, simply log in at majority.fm. You will find the link uh, in the member post uh, associated with that day. Um, I, I, I just uh, a thank you to all the people who have become members over the past uh, several weeks between, you know, the sort of the secular issues with YouTube and the idea that, you know, we do, you're going to find this astonishing, but on YouTube, it, it's not easy to find a big audience 
for the latest on what the Fifth Circuit Court decided. What? And the non-delegation. Here's People are going to find it shocking. We have now a tool that is in our YouTube studio that allows you to search terms to see how much people search them on YouTube. And a lot of people will use that to drive their, uh, their YouTube SEO. Um, you would be not surprised to find out that there's not a lot of people searching for the non-delegation hmm. rule or principle or theory or any of that. In <laughs> fact, um, people are not uh, searching for the, uh, the, the, the Ted Cruz uh, lawsuit. They're not um, looking at things like Lochner era. These are just not big YouTube search terms. I know it's surprising, but um, this is why we want to uh, do that. What? what Microphone specialist, why is Sam so obviously bad at smoking weed? What level of nerd is that? I'm not bad at smoking weed. Who said that? Anyways, um, your, your memberships are, are incredibly helpful, particularly now. We also had that ad problem. That's not going to go away. Hopefully, uh, by the time we get into 2023, it won't be an issue. But uh, that's the way it is now. So uh, become a member today. Join the majorityreport.com. Don't forget, we got merch you can find at shop.majorityreportradio.com. We've got the Discord completely free. Go in there, hang out, get all sorts of resources. Very helpful. Uh, and also justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, chocolate, get 10% off. Coupon code majority. You can also buy the Majority Report blend. Uh, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Lecking Media Universe? Uh, yeah. For uh, left reckoned patrons, we talked to Vina Dubal, who's a la uh, <clears throat> a lawyer, uh, a law professor, uh, focusing on labor issues, talking ab about things like why uh, Silicon Valley companies like to tout their diversity of their sort of executive suite while they uh, lobby to make sure gig workers, which are disproportionately uh, not white folks, uh, get uh, uh, stripped of their the benefits that they should have if we extended. Uh, New Deal era uh, labor protections to those folks. So, uh, Vina Dubal, Patreon.com, just left reckoning to get that. And joining us uh, in the fun half, mm -hmm. where did she come in? There she I'm is. here. Hello. It's. Uh, I've been here. I've been cheering you on. No me. I'm, I'm like invest in the Democratic Party. Wouldn't it be great? Ah, uh, it's so. No. Uh, Daily reminder. It, it, today it was rough. I, uh, Do you need a blunt? I, now I understand it. Now I understand when I said a blunt <laughs> instrument. I get third it. time. I'm saying like yeah, no, it took me three times. Grandpa didn't call them <laughs> blunts. All right, I just said joints back in the joints. day. Uh, uh, no, mate, what's um, happening with you? We've got great news too. Um, we're going to be talking about the biggest nonprofit funders of climate denial. Uh, with Alex Koch on our show tomorrow at 8 p.m. And then later, you should definitely have him on. I'll see how it goes. There is a guy named Nick Marks who has a book out called That's Not Funny, How the Right Makes Comedy Work for Them. Mm. Mm. I don't that know about comedy or pretending or it'll be an interesting conversation. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. The whole book yes. is satire, I'm assuming. He didn't send me a copy, so I can't, you know, pull from it. But, you know, if anybody has a copy, please uh, send me Sounds some like quotes if prank. you happen to have it. Um, all right. Well, let's head into Hilarious. the uh, let's head into the fun half. Uh, we will take your IMs. You can pick up the app at majorityapp.com and IM us. Or uh, we may take phone calls. Not sure. Not sure. We'll see. Uh, but see you in the fun half. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now, but I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. On Matt! You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it! Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun.
Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Um, seven, eight? Yes. Yes. Is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. <sighs> I'm going to go that way. Who libertarian? They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking nailed him! So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge man. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857. 210. 35. 501. One half. 38. 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. Five, four, three trillion dollars sold. It's a zero-sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. On top of it all, yeah. my favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I I don't know. But you should know. The, People the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Look, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. And Emma, we, thanks for the advice. Oh, we, sorry. <laughs> oh.